So I'm pleased to introduce our next speaker. Uh, so Dr. Vivek Shreta, so he's a leading uh, PR, uh, he's a research candidate for the maximum uh, memory area and also he's a director of And uh, he's a leading PR of the uh, uh, Cluster project as well. Uh, so he uh, finished he finished his PhD in the Constant. Yeah. Uh, and then he's uh, uh, yeah, really the uh, fantastic project for um, uh, modeling for the uh, animal collective movement. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Thank you, Wataru. Yeah. Thank you for that uh, introduction. And I'd like to thank all the organizers for putting together this great meeting. I've had a really good time so far. Uh, so I'm Vivek. I'm a postdoc uh, at the Max Planck Institute of Animal Behavior uh, and the University of Constance. And I'm, like Wataru said, a PI of one of the three PIs of my project, where three postdocs kind of heading a project together. And broadly speaking, I'm interested in understanding how and why animals move the way they do, how they search for resources in their environments, and they, how, how they choose amongst these various options, and the ecological and evolutionary consequences of these decisions. But before I go further, I'd like to acknowledge a host of people without whose contributions this work would not be possible. So this includes my advisors, my collaborators, uh, the animal care and technical staff at the University of Constance, uh, and also some friends who <laughs> supported me through the course of this journey. So whether you're an insect uh, trying to decide, find a tall blade of grass to perch on, a fish deciding which conspecifics to school with, or a primate trying to find a foraging patch, most animals at some point in their lives have to make decisions on the go. But most of our understanding of animal decision making comes from experiments like these. Uh, so in neuroscience, uh, this is the dot motion paradigm, which is very common. So what you see here is the rat is showing uh, moving dots on a screen and the rat has to decide which direction majority of the dots are moving. And it's given a juice reward depending on whether it decides correctly or not. Uh, in the field of animal behavior, we use many assays like this. These are called binary choice assays. So this is a schematic, you have a focal individual and it has two conspecifics, individuals of the same species behind glass walls. And we measure uh, its uh, choice based on the proportion of time it spends with potentially one individual or the other. And while these types of assays have greatly furthered our understanding of how animals make decisions, they've missed a key aspect of decision-making, which is movement. So as a community, we've tended to think of decision-making as a process that happens in the brain and movement to be a behavioral readout of the decision that's already been taken. Uh, but what I'll argue is that movement is in fact very crucial and an essential part of the decision-making process. Uh, so recent work in neuroscience has shown that both in the vertebrate and the invertebrate brain, options or targets in space are represented as vectors in the brain. So there are neurons that encode both distance and direction to targets from an egocentric perspective. So here, uh, there's a short video that I'll just play. And what you see here is uh, the ellipsoid body, which is a region in the fruit fly's brain. And what you'll see is that the activity pattern there faithfully represents the position of the blue stripe that you see here. So what this means is that because the animal is representing options from an egocentric perspective, this means that when an animal moves through space, its representation of the world changes in its brain, which in turn feeds back into, uh, affects its movement, which will in turn affect its representation of space in its brain. So there's a recursive feedback between movement and an animal's representation of space in its brain. And uh, so to understand how animals choose among spatially distributed options, what we did is construct a model where we put this feedback into the model. We constructed a model of to understand how the brain computes how neural subpopulations within the brain compete and come to a consensus. Uh, for those of you who are interested, like this essentially ends up being something like an Ising model where the spins have certain directions that they prefer and then there's, they interact with each other. And then if they sort of agree with each other, you have ferromagnetic interactions. And then if they disagree, if there's high disagreement in direction, then there's anti-ferromagnetic interactions. And what our model predicts is uh, that when an animal is presented with two identical options, it should spontaneously move in the average direction between the two options until it hits a critical threshold, 
at which point it will randomly choose one option or the other. And that these, uh, this tra transition is accompanied by an abrupt change in the neuronal dynamics and what we term as a bifurcation. So now we expect, based on this model, we expect that animals would exhibit this specific movement path, and this is what we want to check. But why do we care? Why is this bifurcation interesting? Why does it matter that an, an animal will move in the average path and then randomly choose one or the other? Well, it's because from dynamical systems theory, uh, we know that any system that uh, undergoes bifurcation uh, will see a peak in a, a, a feature called susceptibility. And what this, what this means, susceptibility is essentially a term that represents uh, the sensitivity of the system. So for a, in the context of a decision-making system, this means uh, that the animal is able to amplify small differences between two options that it's uh, presented with. So it's able to make better, more effective decisions irrespective. Uh, and because this uh, bifurcation is associated with a certain region in space, what happens is that undergoing passing through this bifurcation gives the animal a window of space where it becomes sensitive to these options. So based on this model, what we would predict is that an animal starting, starting from this geometric configuration would actually be better at making decisions than an animal that starts in the configuration where the options are diametrically opposed, where it's already passed through the bifurcation. And so what we think is that while we knew for a long time that time taken to decision is important, uh, the perceived differences between options is important to understand decision-making, we think we've identified a third fundamental principle of decision-making, and we think that geometry and uh, representation of space is actually very crucial to understand decision-making amongst distributed options. A second reason why we got excited about looking at these bifurcation patterns was because similar patterns have been all, uh, shown in animal collectives. Uh, so previous work has shown that if you have a group of animals and some uh, some uh, subgroup of this, uh, a subgroup of individuals want to go in one direction and another subgroup wants to go in the other direction, then the group will, on, uh, will move in the average direction between their preference until the conflict between the subgroups exceeds a critical threshold at which point the group will have to come to consensus and choose one option or the other. So it seems like evolution has converged upon the same algorithm for decision-making at these two vastly different scales of organization. And we think this is the benefit, this is because the benefit they gain from this peaking susceptibility. For the individual, this means that it's able to choose uh, a slightly better option when presented with two similar options. For the group, this means that the group is able to make democratic decisions where if one of the subgroups has slightly more individuals than the other, then the group will end up going in that specific direction. Uh, so this is already, this is, some of this work has already been shown to be true with uh, pigeon flocks, uh, fish schools, and uh, baboon troops. So this is great. The theory is, seems like everything sounds great, but we need to test this with real animals. So what we did was we took this and we used a virtual reality system and tested these predictions out with walking locusts and flying fruit flies. And what we did was we presented these animals with static pillars in their environment. Now these insects are very easy to fool because this is how they, they fixate and they navigate. So you presented them with high contrast pillars in their environment. And how these insects navigate is that they, they have an innate tendency to turn towards and walk towards high contrast vertical features in their environment. So we use these innate biases to do the decision-making experiments. Uh, how does the VR work? Well, it works with what are known as anamorphic illusions. So here I'm showing you a Rubik's cube that's on a table. And I'm telling you that this is not a Rubik's cube on a table, but this illusion is so good that it fools your brain into thinking it is actually a three-dimensional object. But this illusion will shortly be broken now and what you realize is that the reason it worked was because of the perspective it was presented to you from. And this is exactly what the VR is doing because we know the position of the animal, we can, pre uh, we can present the world uh, as if it were in this three-dimensional world. And because we're using projections instead of paper cutouts, we can refresh this at very high frame rates and maintain this illusion over longer periods of time. And indeed, when we do these experiments with the flies and the locusts, 
as predicted by our theory, we find that both the flies and locusts exhibit this bifurcation. But what about more than two options? Uh, a lot of models in the decision-making literature focus on binary decisions, but we were interested, but an animal in the wild, especially when you're talking about spatially distributed options, maybe there are many more options that the animal has to choose from. What happens then? Uh, well, our model uh, is able to make predictions uh, for arbitrary number of options. Uh, so for three options, what you find is that the animal will again move in the average of all three options until the outermost targets exceed a critical angular threshold, at which point it will eliminate one of the options and start moving in between the remaining two options. Then it will do a second round of elimination and go to the one option that remains. And in doing this, what it's done is it's reduced the complexity of the decision-making task, which is a three-choice decision, to two binary decisions. Uh, so, And this is exactly what both the flies and the locusts do as well. So they're reducing the complexity of the decision-making task by reducing multi-choice decisions to a series of binary decisions. I just said that this is uh, this works with an arbitrary number of options. So here you see uh, the trajectories that are predicted uh, up to eight options, uh, and these bifurcation processes repeat seem to repeat themselves. Uh, now what we wanted to do was we wanted to go uh, and check, well, we've looked at flies and locusts, but what about vertebrates? If this is something that's uh, so fundamental to decision making, then it must hold across a wide range of taxa. And while the insects that we studied are up here, uh, we decided to go to fish. So we're now going to, we did the experiments with larval zebrafish. And these are experiments uh, by a, a colleague, uh, Liang Li. And what Liang did was he presented the, and we're now not having static environmental features as targets, but actually this is a decision-making context, a social decision-making context, where the fish is trying to decide with which amongst the two virtual fish to school with. So Liang presented these two virtual fish that would move parallel to each other back and forth in the tank. And we would of course get the trajectory of the real fish as it moves and follows these virtual fish. And based on the movements of the real fish, uh, behind these virtual conspecifics, we get a heat map of the position of the real fish where the two red dots represent. Uh, so here the data is represented from the frame of reference of the virtual fish. Since we're interested primarily on in movement in this axis, which is which fish does the real fish school with, we take this data and we compress it along one axis. And then uh, with many experiments where we vary the lateral distance between these virtual fish, we stack all of these data together and we obtain this exact bifurcation uh, that the model predicts. For three options, once again, we find that the fish will reduce the three choice decision to two binary decisions. Now this is uh, the reason this looks different from what you saw with the insects is because of the data being represented in this moving frame of reference, but it's exactly the same model that you saw earlier with the flies and the uh, locusts. What about an asymmetric decision-making scenario? So far, all our uh, scenarios have been uh, completely symmetric, either radially or bilaterally symmetric. So we decided to place the three virtual fish, this time separated, where we have two fish closer to each other on one side, and the third fish further on the other side. Now, most models of decision-making would predict that the real fish should spend twice as long on the side with two conspecifics as opposed to one. But our model actually seems to predict that it should be roughly similar the amount of time the fish spends on either side. Uh, and this seems to be predictive of the data. And uh, in fact, also the uh, peaks are also predicted by this model. Uh, finally, to once again draw the relationship between decision making in the brain and decision making in animal collectives, we went back and we took a model, an established model of collective decision making in animal groups. Where, uh, where it had already, the bifurcation in the two choice context had already been explored. And we took this model and when incorporating the right feedback mechanisms, uh, which are necessary to produce these patterns, uh, we are able to reproduce these series of binary, uh, binary decisions uh, also in the model of collective decision-making. So uh, what we think really with this work is that uh, space is very, very crucial when we talk about decision-making 
uh, at least when we talk about spatially distributed options. Uh, and we think that it's fundamental to effective decision-making in animals. Uh, now, one of the interesting things that came out of uh, this entire process was that we not only considered decision-making in an environmental static, with static environmental targets, but also with conspecifics in the fish case. So this also kind of links to how animals would school. So we were interested in seeing if we could capture this in schools of fish. And uh, if we look at a school of fish, then are certain individuals uh, more likely to influence other individuals and how is influence distributed within the group. Uh, to do this, uh, we, uh, we took uh, data of schooling fish. So this is an empty tank. We just have fish schooling with each other uh, and uh, we tracked them. We got their trajectories uh, and we reconstructed their visual fields. So we had a, a, a host of uh, information about each fish and its relationship with its neighbors. Uh, so we got all these pairwise measures. So the relative angular position of the fish uh, of a fish relative to its neighbor. We had the distance between the pair. We have relative speed. We have acceleration. So we have both kinematic and positional features. Uh, now to look at influence within this group, what we do is we use a pairwise uh, cross uh, time lag cross correlation between their movement directions. So essentially, what this is doing is trying to look at directional copying within the group. If one individual changes direction and delayed in time on other individual changes direction, then we call these, say that these individuals are engaged in a leader follower relationship or that social influence propagates from the first individual to the other. Uh, and we calculate these at different time scales. So also uh, one of the main points here was uh, actually, if we think about the mechanism that drove uh, the follower, followership in the previous study that I showed, that is kind of an interaction that happens at relatively short time scales, but what happens over much longer time scales? And also because we were interested in how is influence distributed within the group? Are there certain individuals that are more consistently leaders versus others? Uh, so now I'm going to show you uh, results of the model just to uh, describe this. So on the x-axis, you have the uh, accuracy of the model. So it's the posterior predictive distribution and you have the sampling iterations. And so we've constructed now three models. The first one is in line with the previous work that I just described. We're putting uh, the prediction, the predictors for the model are the an egocentric vectorial representation of the neighbor. So it's the distance to this neighbor and the direction of this neighbor relative to where I'm headed. The second model incorporates kinematic features because in the literature, if you look at uh, social influence and leadership literature in these animal moving animal collectives, it's largely been said that actually kinematics are a key driver of leadership uh, in especially in some birds. And then finally, of course, a third model that incorporated both of these. Uh, so at short time scales, we find exactly what we expected that actually a vectorial representation of the neighbor seems to be uh, the, the only predictive, uh, seems to be able to predict this social influence, whereas kinematics seems to lack any predictive power on leadership within these groups. Uh, when we look at higher time scales, however, both kinematics and angular and uh, uh, relative position of the neighbor become predictive. Uh, now we did the exact same analysis also with pigeons. So we wanted to look at different species that move in different media. So we took flocks of pigeons. So these are GPS tracks of pigeons and we did the exact same analysis. And broadly speaking, we find the exact same patterns, except when you go to higher time scales, you find actually that kinematics become more predictive of leadership than, uh, than the uh, vector vectorial representation. The reason we think uh, that these two differ at these large time scales is because of the media in which they move. So uh, for birds, actually their movement is, uh, so for a lot of these animals, leadership here is actually coupled with being able to occupy frontal positions within the group. Uh, and for birds, you, you cannot uh, change your speed so easily because your speed is coupled with your flapping 
And if you stop flapping, then you also start to descend. So their movement is tightly coupled with their media, whereas fish have swim bladders, so they can actually stop and move as they please. So this is why we think that kinematics actually become much more important for the birds over longer time scales than they do for fish. And again, uh, this is great because actually the fact that kinematics becomes important in birds is, is consistent also with a huge body of literature that's looked at this uh, before as well. Uh, so now going back to the questions that I had posed before, what is the influence structure within the collective? So now we've looked at these pairwise influence metrics, but now we want to look at how it's distributed within the group. Are there certain individuals who tend to be leaders more often than others, or is leadership or influence distributed more equally within, group, within the group? And uh, this is what we find. So what I'm going to show you is so our data has two group sizes of 10 and 30 individuals. And I measured the distribution of influence with the Gini coefficient. So typically it's used to measure in income inequality in countries. So a high Gini coefficient would mean that there are few ind fewer individuals with more income. In this case, few individuals that exert a lot of influence within the group and most individuals with little, little influence. And a low Gini coefficient would indicate that actually influence is distributed more evenly within the group. And what we find is that as we analyze the data over longer time scales, the Gini coefficient increases, suggesting that at small time scales, anybody can be a leader. So anybody could potentially influence other individuals within the group, but over longer time scales, these differences between individuals aggregate and you start seeing consistent between individual differences, uh, creating some individuals to lead the group much more often than others. Uh, I will now move on to more of my current work. So this is uh, the project that I'm working on now. So also with the cluster of collective behavior. And this is a grant that we got with two other postdocs, Himal Nayak and Akang Sharathor. So it's the three of us, uh, we're basically working on this project together. And the goal here is to try and understand the mating mate choice and uh, mating success of antelopes. Uh, and what these antelopes do is they exhibit a mating system that's called lecking. So lecking is very rare mating system in the animal kingdom, uh, more often seen in birds and less in mammals, but still very rare. And what it's typically, what it is, is that males aggregate and establish very closely clustered territories. And the females visit these territories uh, for the purpose of choosing mates. So here, for example, these are sage grouse in the US and you see a lot of them aggregated. So this is them having their own territories. And during the breeding season peak, the females will visit these territories for mating. Now this, uh, from my perspective, presents a great scenario to actually study decision-making in the wild. Uh, it's the males have elaborate displays. Uh, I, uh, so the female actually has to, like, I mean, if you think of the female having to compare the quality of males, it's relatively low cost of sampling because all the males have aggregated in one place. And one of the key factors that defines select is that the male's territories are devoid of any resources. So a lot of mate choice in animals is also tightly coupled with potentially some kind of other benefit that the mate may receive by mating with a certain individual. So either uh, rich in resources, some kind of food or something, but in Lex, the entire arena is devoid of any resources. So really the only purpose to visit these uh, male aggregations for a female is to mate. And one of the key characteristics of a lek is that it has high skew in male mating success. So a lot of females will mate with relatively few males uh, within these leks. So this is actually one of the reasons why evolutionary biologists are very, very interested in leks is because it causes high uh, sexual, it's a beds for high sexual selection because there's very few male traits that are going to be passed on to the next generation. Uh, so what we, our goal is to study the social and spatial drivers that drive mate choice on legs. And what we do to do this is record, use drones to record aerial videos of these animals. 
So these are black dots. They're the antelopes that we study. Uh, the black individuals are the males and the lighter colored individuals are the females. All these black spots that you see on the ground is actually poop and it's used, it's what the males use to mark their territory. So each of these poops is the uh, any given male's territory. And already from this video, you can see that most females have aggregated around that male's territory and there's not much else going on in the rest of the leg. So these are the type of videos that we get. Uh, now, of course, and a drone's battery life is only about 15 minutes. So it's not long data that we get. So what we do is we do relays. So you've seen a new drone come about. There's a, the previous drone that was recording below. And this drone will now move up and leave. And uh, the new drone will take its place. So by doing these relays, we are able to record data for much, much longer. And our sessions end up being about two hours each. So the breeding season is about three weeks long. We get data two hours in the morning, two hours in the evening, every day throughout the breeding season. Uh, now, even if you do that, so this is kind of the entire Leking arena. And uh, uh, so what, and this is a super resolution image. So actually we've taken many, many different images, stitched it together to create an entire map of the Lek. And now if you take one drone and do these relays, you're still only able to cover a small part of the Lek. You can't cover much more. So now what we do is that we use three drones and we do the relays. So we now have basically still not the whole leg, but a decent size of the leg. And we're trying to, and this is essentially what we want to analyze. We take all this data. Uh, we're working with an extremely talented master student, Jun Ran Yang, who's uh, working with us on the detections and trackings of these animals uh, from these videos. Uh, so here is... Uh, relatively new uh, uh, data. So like what you see already, there are some issues that we've identified here with the shadows. And uh, so they are, these are still we're debugging this. Uh, we're also working on, so I showed you all of that nicely in that map, but once we get all these images tracked, we also need to port all of them into the same coordinate space inside that bigger map. So we're working on uh, doing the registration for that. Uh, so all of this is going to take quite some time, as you can imagine. But meanwhile, we're also parallelly trying to work a little bit on trying to think about the ontogeny of a leg, so how the leg develops, because we record this over the course of the season. So I showed you one of those maps. We do this every other day, and we have these maps over the course of the season. Uh, so if you zoom in, you can also see kind of how activity peaks in the leg, so relatively empty. Some individuals arrive, this is sort of the peak of the breeding season, and then the leg dies down. So you can kind of see this. We can also look at if you go back and you look at these territories, how they're distributed. It seems, I don't know, I mean, this we have to analyze this, but it seems so evenly distributed and so geometric that there must be some kind of pattern within it. Naively, I would expect, I mean, not quite exactly, but something like a packing because it's 2D if you are trying to cluster. If you can hold a radial territory, you would see hexagonal packing. Of course, with some error because some individuals maybe have a better holding capacity than others. But these are things we want to look at. Uh, not only can we look at this uh, within a year, these animals actually modify the land so much that you can actually see this from space. And uh, thanks to historic imaging, we can also go back and start looking at these territories and how they're structured across years. And so we're now trying to quantify like formation of these territories within a season and across a season. And hopefully once we have the tracking, try to look at mate choice in this system. Well, but that's about what I have to say today. Thank you so much. <laughs> Um, so again, Ian Butler, we'll have a nice question. Uh, hi, thanks so much. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thanks for a great talk. Um, I don't remember exactly what animal model you were using, but I, I remember you were talking about um, on the difference of like shorter timescales versus longer timescales, how on the shorter timescales, there's a uh, greater opportunity for kind of differing plot specifics by your yeah. inputs. I was just wondering whether um, it, before they kind of revert to you know the, the normal hierarchies of yeah. meters or fulfillment, 
And is that in that initial kind of shorter time scale, is that influence diluted amongst the conspecifics when they're all headed by or, or So what what do you mean is it diluted? Yeah, so like I, I guess like the in individuals like influence, like one mm -hmm. one individual's uh, influence, is that kind of diluted by the fact that everybody has more kind of the Yes, way? yes, yes. I mean at short time scales, I think uh, everyone is kind of I, has influence to some degree. I think you have a lot more changing influences, like nobody is able to influence anyone consistently. So kind of who's has a, who has influence keeps changes much more dynamically. I mean, at short time scales, but like, yes, it's diluted in a sense that uh, when you analyze there, it's much more evenly distributed. Well, I, overall, I think, I mean, influence should be very similar within the group, but it is more spread out, distributed. Yeah, I guess I kind of what I was, um, more getting at is um, and maybe our covered this is just like whether it, it even is influence, like whether any individual thought can have any influence on like the other individuals if it's just so hectic, uh, um, as opposed to like you know, ah, I, I see. So, so one of the caveats here is that how we analyze the data also comes maybe into your question is that we assume that at any given point in time, an individual can only follow one other individual. So there is some work in some fish where they've shown that interactions within fish schools are pairwise. Other literature for birds suggests differently. So there is, uh, but for sake of simplicity, we assume that you can only ever follow one individual. So you do get much more switches between whom you're following at these shorter time scales. Yeah. I was wondering whether leadership or the kind of leader follower uh, social forces could uh, be like the next method for the individual um, interaction that you need in the collective behavior model to obtain the same duplication patterns that you see on the screen or easy model. That makes, uh, make sense. In the collectives, yeah. where do you get the inhibition from? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yes, I think that's where it could come from. Yes, because basically you get. Uh, leader follower and you get directional copying and then you're inhibited because you're not going in the direction where you want and then you you lower your preferences because of this copying that arises potentially yeah yes it, it could be one of the sources i can't i don't know if that would be the only way you could get this uh inhibition or this negative feedback in the collectives but it could be one of the mechanisms that could drive this Yeah. Um, I was wondering uh, like, uh, how the bifurcation point is defined. Is it sort of very parameter to the data or is it naturally defined based on like the use? Right? No, so so here it's, uh, so that's something we also, no, it, it is here it's defined as a free parameter that we just fit the model. And then I think in uh, the statistical model, when we fit to the data, it's a free parameter that's fit in the, the other model, the the Ising type model, there there is again a parameter. So these these models they're based of what are known as neural ring attractor networks. So you have relatively local excitation and long range or global inhibition, and this is how uh, direction is encoded in the brain. So you have ring of neurons and neurons that encode similar directions excite each other, and neurons that encode different directions will inhibit each other. And where do you change? Where is the tolerance? of where you stop exciting and inhibi inhibiting, and that's kind of determines at what angle you would bifurcate. So the yes, 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 yes. Actually, I don't want to interrupt you, Jante. So maybe then I have uh, five options. Yes. Uh, and we just uh, similar to this. So mm -hmm. I that actually have to respond very much. I don't want to get to that. If I you know, take five or five, yeah. I need to make another push. Uh, because I'm so lazy, so I just want to yeah. save my time. Right? <laughs> uh, so, if, 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 if you can consider this kind of decision making cost, yeah. uh, that model to be uh, to be implemented. So, I think right now, I think this is also absolutely a good point because I think right now, how the model is constructed, we also don't, it's, it doesn't account for distance. So if I take one option that's here and the other option that's far in town, you would, or like one that's at the end corner of this room, the other that's in town there, you would still get a bifurcation at an angle, but potentially 
if they are identical as a, any animal would probably go to the closer option than go to the one that's really far if you perceive them to be identical. But these types of costs are in the current state, they're not included in the model. And yeah, yeah. Thank you. So I think uh, from the model's perspective, there are certain factors. So one is like the neural noise, which you could think of as how noisy your neurons are firing. That could be sort of sensory noise, but noise would affect the where the bifurcation happens. The other factor is this tuning of the weights of the network. I mean, here we fit it, we set it to a specific fixed tuning. Potentially there are other, the brain maybe has mechanisms by which it can tune it based on some kind of uncertainty you could think of uh, because like I said, like passing through the bifurcation is actually beneficial to make more effective decisions. So you could potentially try to think that uh, if there is some parameter based on the certainty or uncertainty of your decisions, you can try to tune this to happen earlier or later. And uh, that could, but these are speculations. 